Good morning, everyone. Um, I will be speaking in English, so if you need to get a translation, um, now's the moment. Um, so, um, where are we? I think uh, for sure it's very clear that the, um, the climate crisis um, uh, and the ecological crisis that we're facing is the, the defining challenge of, of our times. And how we think about that, how we understand the questions that it raises, um, and also how we act is absolutely critical. Because what we think and what we do will shape the societies that we live in in the future. Uh, and I think that we have to think together, but we also have to act together. And what I want to talk about briefly this morning is I think what we can see is a, a really uh, rapidly growing um, and very dynamic climate justice movement. Um, it's, a, it's a new space, a new way of thinking, uh, which is bringing together many different sectors um, who have a strong system critical perspective. And we can say that the, the common slogan or the common uh, perspective that is shared by uh, the groups who would identify themselves as being part of a global uh, climate justice movement. Yeah, thanks, sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Um, would, are saying we need system change, not climate change. So it is a very strong system critical perspective. Uh, the climate justice movement, um, even though the, the name itself might be relatively new, I think has its origins and its roots in many of the struggles and many of the movements uh, that have been very active in the World Social Forum and in other places for the last decades. Of course, the environmental movement, but also the movement for land reform, the women's movement, the peasants' movement, many of the urban movements, the struggles for water, for land, for forests, for community control over resources, the labour movement, the workers' movement, all of these movements um, have a common uh, home, a common uh, uh, agenda uh, that is being developed and shaped in what we call the climate justice movement. Uh, because climate and the ecosystem in which we live touches everyone. We live in a common ecological space. Uh, and so there is no sector of society that is excluded or not somehow affected by what we do uh, and how we respond to this challenge that we're facing. I want to talk a little bit about what, what's happening in the, uh, the official spaces of the UN negotiations and to talk about how we can use those opportunities as well as, as many other moments to actually strengthen our movement and to put some real propositions on the table. The, the climate justice movement, uh, I think, was really uh, born um, uh, under a common umbrella. Uh, a couple of years ago at the uh, UN climate talks in Bali. Uh, and there was a small initiative by a, a, a group of 30 or 40 organizations to say what is happening in the UN negotiations is completely unacceptable. We resist and we condemn the market-based solutions, the techno fixes, the business as usual approach that is so dominant in the UN negotiations. And so many of these groups felt that it was important not only to build the movement on the outside, but also to have a strong criticism and a strong challenge inside the UN negotiations to say that what is being discussed here is not a solution to the climate crisis, but is simply a way to continue business as usual. Uh, if we fast forward from Bali to the, um, the climate talks in Copenhagen uh, just one month ago in December, I think we can see that the, uh, the impact of this 
new way of thinking and this new way of talking was very strong. If you look at the media reports, if you look at how some of the debates are being uh, uh, shaped, the kind of issues that are coming up into, onto the table, uh, we can see that the social questions and the political questions are now at the heart of the climate negotiations. No one really is talking about the technical or the scientific at the moment. It's really a question of who pays, who controls the solutions, who is responsible, uh, and what is the, uh, at least in the climate negotiations, there is a very strong debate between the North and the South, between the North, which has the historical responsibility, and the South, which is not only feeling the impacts of the ecological crisis, but has also suffered much of the inequality and the exploitation of the capitalist system itself. And so, of course, amongst the, the governments at the, at the top level of the states, the, the governments of the South are talking very much about the right to development. And I think this is where the, the climate justice movement has an absolutely critical role to play because as all of the previous speakers have mentioned, we have a critique of the development model. We do not defend the right to development if what it means is more of the same. We cannot accept an idea of development which is based on exploitation, which is based on inequalities, which is based on an endless destruction of the planet's resources and of, of communities. So I think it's not, we don't accept the, the right to development um, as it is being proposed by many of the big developing countries. But at the same time, we also have to acknowledge that there is an historical responsibility that the wealth of the rich countries has been accumulated at the expense of the impoverishment of the South and the destruction of the resources of the South. So justice means many different things at many different levels. Uh, and that's why I think it's important that as a climate justice movement, we're able to engage in the local struggles, in the national policy debates, but also in the international arena so that we don't accept the definitions of development that have been accepted in the UN framework, but that we can talk about things differently. Uh, many people have said that the Copenhagen climate talks were a, a failure, that it was a, a complete uh, collapse of the talks, and, and most people see that this is a, a very depressing and, and uh, rather disempowering result. Uh, but I would see it very differently. In fact, I think that what happened in Copenhagen showed us the incredible uh, weakness of the current approach, the lack of democracy, uh, the exclusion of really critical voices in the climate negotiations, and the fact that in Copenhagen, the, the governments were only able to achieve an extremely minimal kind of political agreement that was only accepted by a handful of countries I think is better than having some legally binding agreement which is very weak. Because if we ended up with something that was very weak, that didn't really deal with the urgency or the reality of the, of the challenge that we're facing, then I think many people would have simply wiped their hands and said, okay, that's, that's the problem solved, there's now a legal agreement, we just have to wait for the next phase of the Kyoto and the business is taken care of. But because the Copenhagen climate talks showed us all of the problems, all of the manipulation, all of the lack of democracy, all of the exclusions, all of the self-interest of the global elite, it means that we have the possibility now to really build a powerful and dynamic and plural and diverse climate justice movement across the globe. So I think it opens the doors for us rather than shuts down the opportunities.